Hi, everyone. I'm really jealous about your supercomputer, by the way. Um, OK. So, yes, yeah, so I'm a scientist. And according to Scientific American, American, sorry, Scientific American, and a whole range of other sources, including Wikipedia, apparently one of the biggest questions that should be keeping scientists like myself awake at night is this question of, can we ever beat photosynthesis? So just to rephrase that for you, um, so that you probably get a better understanding of this, it's asking us whether we can reinvent photosynthesis in our own terms, using our own materials, so that we can perform, outperform nature. And for me to start, or for us actually, to start investigating how to answer this question, I thought before we do that, we should actually try and understand why this should be keeping me awake. So I've constructed this diagram for you. So here we have a large circle, this yellow circle here, is basically representing the amount of energy that we receive from the sun every year. And in the middle is a tiny dot, and that dot is representing the amount of energy that we as a whole planet is consuming in terms of energy. And then on the right of that dot is a purple dot, and that purple dot represents the amount of energy that we're using, sorry, that we're generating um, from our renewable sources such as hydro and wind power. And on the very right, we have a brown dot, and that dot represents the amount of energy we have stored in fossil fuels. So currently, in the UK, 80% of our energy is derived from the brown dot. Now, this is a bit ridiculous, considering we have so much of the yellow dot. And so, obviously, this is a problem. But encouragingly, we are making a push towards renewables, as you all know. Um, but the problem with renewables is that even though there's so much of it, uh, it's very intermittent, and that means it's not very reliable. And so even with all the great progress we've made in solar cells, etc., we really need to start focusing on developing ways of capturing this energy um, in a long-term and secure way. And so that brings me to photosynthesis. We all know that plants and cyanobacteria and algae, they all are able to store light energy in the form of chemicals. And so if we can mimic this and do it better, this, is one of be, this is, will be one of the most renewable and sustainable way of us replacing fossil fuels. So just to explain what photosynthesis is, so I always think of photosynthesis as a little bit of um, a not such a complex reaction. Because essentially what we're doing is we're taking very simple abundant molecules, such as what we have on the left here, so water and carbon dioxide, a bit of sunlight, and we're converting it into something that is higher value, so in this case it's sugar. But we can even break that down a bit more, because we know that's what we need to think about when we're thinking about photosynthesis, is that we need light absorption, obviously, and then we need to somehow rearrange the bonds, break bonds, and remake bonds to make new chemicals, and then the thing is, bonds are made of electrons, so the final process is that we need to think about how to get electrons from where bonds are broken to where bonds are remade. And so in artificial photosynthesis, when we're trying to replicate this process, we're trying to use these concepts that apply it to different reactions that can make fuels. And the easiest or the simplest reaction is water splitting. Okay, so we can basically get hydrogen and oxygen from our water. And in this case, the hydrogen is a high value molecule because we can use it, it's a few in its own right, and also it's a building blocks of um, longer hydrocarbon chains and also ammonia, which we use for our gardening. So in this case, this is a very important um, reaction that even biology does. So even cyanobacteria and uh, algae carries out this reaction. So if we want to beat biology, or if we want to beat photosynthesis at doing this reaction, we need to do all of the above. So we need to make systems which can outperform um, biology in terms of light harvesting, in terms of rearrangement of bonds, and electron transfer. So let's compare how we're going against biology one by one. 
So let's start with how are we going in terms of light harvesting. So here I've shown a plot of solar radiation spectrum. So essentially, we see a spread of the wave, different wavelengths of light we have from sunlight. And anything that is on the left of 1,000 nanometers, that energy can be used to break water apart. So you can see that um, what nature uses is this pigment called chlorophyll, and that chlorophyll can absorb in that range in the green. So that covers about 28% of the solar range. Now, in terms of artificial systems, what we have is access to the incredible range, uh, range of materials that's been developed by uh, solar cells. So, for example, we have p-silicon cells, which can absorb in that range, in the blue, and that covers about 20% easily. And in addition to that, we also have a whole range of other materials like perovskites, semiconductors dyes, and these all um, absorb in different parts of the spectrum, and they can, com be, they can be combined together to reach efficiencies of past 45%. So in this respect, we are winning in terms of the artificial team. Okay, so that's light absorption. So what about the second process? So the rearrangement of bonds. The making, the breaking, the rearrangement of bonds. Now, whenever we do this, we actually have to use a catalyst. Now, I don't know how many people know what a catalyst is, so let's do a simple analogy. So imagine if I gave all of you a can of pineapple, and I want you to please open the can for me with your bare hands. Now, I can kind of suspect what I'm going to get back from you. It will be something like this. Because it's incredibly difficult to open a can of anything without a tool, right? Now imagine if I handed you a can opener. Now you can just imagine how much faster that's going to be. So you'd bring your can close to the blades. You can just slot the, the ridge into the blades. And then you can clamp down the handles tighten it, and then the blade will pierce through the top of the can, and as you rotate the wheel, it will just slide very smoothly around the top of the can, so you slice open the lid, and you can open the can. So basically, a can opener is like a catalyst. So a catalyst is a tool that we use in chemistry. It's a chemical tool, and in nature, what catalysts are, um, are enzymes. So in nature, we have lots of catalysts, and they're all called enzymes. Nature have developed a range of enzymes that can do a, such in, a, amazing chemical reactions that we as chemists can't do. And in the analogy of water splitting, the can opener for water molecules is this enzyme here called photosystem 2. And I've highlighted the bit where the water actually binds. So what happens is that the water binds on, and the, the active site holds onto the water, rearranges the bonds, and holds it still, and then extracts electrons from it at the same time. So that's how catalysis happen. And if we think about what we can make in a lab compared to what nature has. Well, we also have catalysts. They're much more simple. Um, sometimes we try to make them look like the catalysts of the active sites of enzymes, and they work. They do work, but they work more like a rusty kitchen knife because you will have to put in a lot more effort, a lot more energy, and it will take more time. So essentially, we... Uh, we don't have as much, uh, we, we do not compete as well in the catalyst category. We do have some that are good. We do have some good catalysts, but most of them are made from materials that lie in this middle part of the periodic table, so they're very earth rare. Uh, whereas nature has been just using whatever's been around, so it's really used to just taking elements that are most abundant, so on the top row there that I've highlighted, and so that's how they become so scalable. So, in the sense, I'm going to give two marks to nature for this, because they can do catalysis so incredibly well, and also they use rare, uh, so they use earth-abundant materials to do it. 
However, because the catalysts that we make in the lab are much smaller, you probably notice that the enzymes are really big, um, it means it doesn't really matter that they're so slow because we can just squeeze more of them in the same space. So, in this case, they kind of equalize. Okay, so that's a second process. Um, not a real clear winner at the moment between nature and us. What about the charge transfer? Okay, so we're gonna look at what happens inside of a cell first. So, in this case, what I've highlighted, or this cartoon you can see, is basically the photosynthetic chain. And we're trying to move electrons from where the bonds are broken. So in this case, it's at the bottom. The green enzyme is, is the enzyme that I showed you before, photosystem two. And we want to move it to where the bonds will be remade. So that would be, in this case, the purple enzyme. That's a hydrogenase, and that forms hydrogen. And both the photosystem two and the hydrogenase are enzymes, and they both work incredibly well. However, the entire process is extremely inefficient. Right, the efficiency of this particular reaction is less than 1%, way less than 1%. So why is that? Well, for one thing, the hydrogenase is quite picky about the type of environment that it likes to work in. The other thing is that electrons have to actually pass through at least five other proteins before reaching the hydrogenase. And then when it reaches that red one, the ferrodoxin, the ferrodoxin just basically shoves it, shuttles it somewhere else, just because there are so many different pathways that uses electrons inside a cell. And actually, the favored pathway is to glucose synthesis, um, the Kelvin cycle, but even the efficiency for that does not exceed 6%, so it's still quite low. Okay, so the reason why we have such a big role of proteins and why this is needed for the cell is because it really helps the cell with taking control and regulating um, uh, and adapting to the environment. So cells, in this case, uses these um, as a pro-survival mechanism. Okay, uses these proteins to regulate everything inside. Now, when we're doing artificial photosynthesis, this is the cell that we use. Okay, so it's very simple, it's two compartments, it's got this membrane, we can separate the two reactions, and essentially what we do on one side is we do water oxidation, which we just split the bonds of water um, using a catalyst, one of the catalysts I described before, and then the electrons can be taken out, it just flows through a wire and goes to the other side, and that's where it meets another catalyst and you form hydrogen. So you can see it's much simpler than what you get in biology. And so I'm giving it another score just because it means that it's very efficient. And in fact, the most efficient systems, the state-of-the-art artificial photosynthetic systems for water splitting now has reached a whooping 30%. So that is pretty impressive. However, what it's not good at is being robust which a cell is good at. Because without those repair mechanisms, without all these extra pathways, it actually um, is not going to last for very long by itself. It doesn't repair itself if it breaks. And a lot of those materials are very fragile. So hence, I'm gonna give nature another point. Uh, so at this point, you can see that there's not, like, to me at least, there's not a clear winner. And if you ask me, have we beaten photosynthesis, I would probably say I don't even think they're running the same race. Just because I think na nature is actually running um, a endurance marathon and artificial photosynthesis is running a sprint for efficiency. And so what I do notice is that they've got overlapping weaknesses and strengths and probably that's what led us to this idea of what if we can combine the best of both worlds? So what if we can now start to isolate the bits that are the, most, uh, the best bits of nature and the best bits of the artificial world and we combine them? And so, for example, in this case, the artificial setup will actually give us a platform to rewire photosynthesis so we can omit the inefficient pathways and would, what would this give us? Would this give us something with a brand new performing um, parameter to test? And so we tried it. And this is the first cell that we put together. And it wasn't easy, just because we had to completely redesign uh, the electrodes 
Just because the enzymes are so much bigger, we need to make them much more porous. So now we have these conductive sponges, essentially, where we load it with enzymes. And I was able then to wire photosystem 2 on one side to the hydrogenase on another side. And I shine light on it, and you could measure hydrogen. And the efficiency we got from this was 5.4% when it's optimized. So this is not too bad, but that's way better than what we can get in, in nature. But not as good as what you can get in a state-of-the-art artificial photosynthetic system. However, we're still playing around with it. Um, we're adding lots of different types of um, light absorbers so that we can tune what kind of light we can pick up. And also, we're really excited by the fact that maybe we can change up the enzymes so we can rewire another pathway. Now, in the end, when I was thinking about this, I mean, is the right question to ask, can we beat photosynthesis? I mean, would it be better, actually, if we start working with photosynthesis? Because in the end, if we want enduring, um, successful energy conversion regimes, they need to be not just efficient, they need to be robust and scalable, all of which nature is. Um, and we can try and combine this, which we did, so you know, it's very easy to achieve one of those three properties, but it's hard to get all three together. And we can try and combine this, for example, using this semi-artificial photosynthetic system. However, even though we did get some pretty interesting results and we, we met some pretty um, happy middle ground between the two fields, the isolated enzymes that we use in the end turn out to be very unstable. And so they degrade it after a while. So that means that all the devices that we'll be building will not really be applicable to anything useful. But maybe this will change if we find a way to stabilize the enzymes. I think what I got out of this, even though we don't have a, a good working device that will save the world, we have now a platform in which we can use to wire different enzymes together, so we can use it to rewire different conversion pathways together that has never been done before and has never been possible before. So for me, it's a win anyway. Thank you very much.